Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Pathfinder Workshop. Uh, this is going to be kind of a, a free-flowing panel. We're going to uh, work with everybody in the chat and talk uh, talk with each other and just kind of uh, come up with something fun that you can adapt to use in your game, uh, get you some ideas, uh, and make use of some of the stuff that is in uh, the recently released Dark Archive book. Uh, that's kind of going to be uh, our starting point, our seed for this, uh, but we can kind of uh, cooperatively take it in whatever direction uh, everybody's interested in. Uh, I'm going to go uh, go around the table here and get introductions. I'll start with myself. I'm Logan Bonner. I'm the Pathfinder lead designer, which means that I kind of oversee the rules of the game as a whole and do a bunch of development work on the rulebook line primarily. Um, and I'm going to pass it next to Mike. Hey, I'm Michael Sayre, Senior Designer here at Paizo. Uh, I also work on the rulebook line, uh, doing things like uh, writing and developing new classes, uh, developing new rules and stuff that go into the game, and uh, uh, a lot of what Logan does with just slightly less responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then I believe next we have Linda. I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. I am a development manager here at Paizo. I um, am for the digital adventures team. So the main thing that we make is organized play adventures, Pathfinder Society and Starfinder Society. But we've also have our fingers in the pie of other digital adventures, such as one shots and bounties. All right. Thank you, Linda and Patrick. Oh, you're muted, Patrick. Patrick is our silent partner. He is the most mysterious. Uh, <laughs> perhaps magically had his voice stolen. <laughs> that sounds like uh, something straight out of the Dark Archive. Yeah. Actually, while, while Patrick's getting that uh, figured out, this is a good time to start getting some ideas from chat. Uh, like I said, we're going to be making kind of a, a Dark Archive inspired uh, workshop creation. It's going to be along the lines of the case files in this book. So the case files are individual kind of uh, mysteries um, and uh, and uh, some type of weirdness in the world. Uh, we have ex uh, we have case files on a bunch of different topics, um, and this can be similar to those. So I'm just looking for ideas for like what is a weird thing that people might be able to explore uh, in Golarian and in your campaign. Uh, Patrick, do we have your your voice? Can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. Yes, All right. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Uh, sorry, so I'm a, Patrick Hurley, I'm a senior editor at Paizo. I work on Starfinder, Pathfinder, all the different lines and uh, the society stuff as well. Um, I'm also a published science fiction, fantasy, and horror writer, so uh, I'm really excited to be on this panel. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, we... Uh... I don't think this was meant as a suggestion, but someone said Patrick sold his voice to the Goblin Market, which does sound like it could be a case file on its own. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there's um, the the way Dark Archive works, it kind of goes uh, into different categories like cults or secret societies, cryptids, and it has a case file connected to each of those. And there are also a bunch of... Uh, uh, incident reports uh, in the book that are kind of smaller, kind of uh, individual standalone um, pieces that are along a similar theme. Uh, so really it could be kind of any, uh, any fun uh, thing that springs to mind. Uh, see someone suggested dragon lore. Uh, we got that, that suggestion from uh, TRDG11. Uh, are there some some fun, uh, weird, and mysterious dragons? What are what are folks' uh, favorite kind of dragon tropes? Hmm. Well, I always. Uh, uh... All right. Uh, I was going to say, one of the things that I always like is when you get the dragon that is also another type of monster. Part of that might just be because I've I've killed so many dragons in my day. But when you get like the dragon that is a vampire and so the you know the players have to deal with that like is it a dragon or is it a vampire until you get to you know whip away the curtain and go ha ha both 
Uh, so that's always, I think, a really fun thing uh, for me, especially when you've got a situation like this where uh, you want a little bit of mystery and uh, a little bit of the unusual mixed in. Yeah. And then you also have, you know, if a dragon is a vampire, it had to become a vampire from somewhere. So there might still be another vampire around. <laughs> and it had to become a dragon from somewhere. So there might be a parent dragon around also. Uh, Patrick, what were you going to say about dragons? Oh, I always, I think, uh, you know, I don't know if people have seen uh, the first season of uh, Discworld or read those books it's based on, but I think dragons and cults sort of go hand in hand. Uh, dragons mm -hmm. make the ideal, like, you know, ringleader of a secret cult, especially if they can take on human form. So you don't know, maybe the first time the players meet them, they are a humanoid of some sort, but they just seem to be, there's something a little bit mysterious and dangerous about them. Yeah. Uh, we also got a suggestion from chat. Um, ideas for dragons developed in the first world that didn't make the final cut of reality. That's a suggestion for possible cabbage. Um, that, I think, is a fun idea. I think that fits along uh, pretty well with the Dark Archive. Um, yeah, I was, uh, was going to say something similar to, uh, to, to what Patrick said of the idea of the, uh, the person who you don't know is a dragon when you first encounter them who has something else going on. Yeah. So. yeah. I, th I think those two concepts can kind of go together because you can have uh, you kind of have layer upon layer of mystery, which I think works well if you're doing like a, a full adventure uh, in this style. You can kind of have like you know the 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 superficial tier is like oh this weird cult is doing weird cult stuff, and that's like it seems like there's uh, this person's more than they seem this cult leader, and then it's like oh they're a dragon, and then it's like well they're not quite a dragon, and then it's you know there's weird first world fey um, ab absurdity kind of mixed in there. Um, so I kind of like that, uh, you know, that parfait approach to the the, the uh, structure of our potential case file here. Um, I'd love to get some suggestions from chat of like some of the other NPCs who might relate be related to that. If we have kind of this, you know, uh, this multi tiered structure. Um, so yeah, uh, the first part of these, and I'm going to throw to one of the other panelists here to kind of uh, pitch some ideas for it. Um, kind of the top level here is our secret society. So what are some cool secret society things we might incorporate into this? Does anybody have uh, some some strong thoughts on that? Some so sort of dragons. symbol of mem- oh. No, please go ahead, Linda. I was thinking some sort of uh, some sort of symbol of membership that is that it, that is subtle and mysterious that the PCs might start to come across. It's like, what is the symbol? What is, that I'm seeing appear on people's clothing or or like etched into buildings or things like that. Yeah, like uh, yeah, something you can kind of put in the adventures beforehand that you know suggests that something's coming. Maybe uh, as a token, sort of a dragon scale or something like that. All of a sudden, I had this idea like they could even have a passcode like the scales balance or I don't know something. <laughs> a nice little double entendre, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of the uh, things that's kind of neat, to, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say ahead, one Mike. of the things that's kind of neat with the secret society and the idea of a dragon is that the dragon itself might not actually be the like primary force that a group of adventurers need to deal with. The dragon might actually be uh, kind of the key to unraveling it all. Cause I'm thinking like, you know, if you have a secret society, if you've got something like the Masons, but then you've got a dragon that can live for, you know, a thousand or more years, you've always got one person who you can go to who can tell you what the minutes were 400 years ago during the last secret society yeah. meeting, you know? Uh, but also you don't have that same kind of slow bleed of knowledge where the secret society might like devolve from its original purpose. So you can play a lot with like really, really long-term plans and have the, his uh, the PCs figuring out the history of this secret society uh, and figuring out what is happening now based on books that, you know, might be hundreds of years old. Yeah, you could, they could do some investigation into the history of, uh, of this symbol, say, right? They find the symbol, they look into it, and they see it kind of recur over multiple time periods and slowly piece together how that all fits into the modern secret society that they're looking at. Uh, 
So uh, I'd like to get some ideas from chat for uh, names for this organization uh, with its with its uh, its passphrase of the scales balance. Uh, a couple other thoughts that uh, that chat has dropped for us is uh, uh, a, with a wizard stalked by death who is tasked to taking down the cult. So that could be like an NPC who you talk to who kind of uh, helps you uh, crystallize your your ideas into a more of a plan. Uh, something Illuminati esque, where they're tied to all layers of a society, uh, deep down and quietly. Um, an adventure where conspirators are all investigators in disguise. Uh, cat burglars who pinch shiny things for the dragon. So if the dragon is kind of a classic, you know, hoarding style dragon, this could be like a long term wealth building scheme, uh, which kind of fits into the the pyramid scheme uh, idea. Um, <laughs> Benny Jesseret accepts dragons. I had a thought based on the um the that that cat burglar idea too. It's maybe maybe the dragon is somewhat more hands off on some aspects and allows the uh, allows some of the leaders within the cult to go about things in their own way and then compete with each other mm -hmm. to determine who's going to be more effective at um, at achieving those long term goals. So there might be some uh, there might be some factionalism within the cult or some ability which could create some uh, some mystery in the beginning. I was like, wait, are they doing this? Are they doing this? Well, they're kind of doing both, yeah. but they're all working toward this greater goal. Yeah, they're kind of almost like as long as they're meeting their numbers, you know, they can <laughs> have some autonomy, right? It's yeah, I, I need this amount of gold. Make sure <laughs> this that's dragon right. thieves. This Dragon's Thieves Guild sounds an awful lot like the Church of Razmir in setting. I, I'm trying to figure out in what ways they're meaningfully <laughs> different, and I'm not coming up with a lot. <laughs> the, the main one is that Razmir is very annoyed that they're also doing the same scheme. <laughs> this is also, um, since we're talking about kind of like how the secret society operates and the idea of having, you know, some, uh, some sub-agents, uh, this is a spot where, like, if I'm, you know, planning on running something, this is where I you know, I, I look to kind of the rules to crystallize something. So like Dark Archive, the Secret Society section has a bunch of Secret Society gear. And a lot of it is about like hiding things and, you know, uh, being able to pass things in plain sight. Um, so that might be a spot where it's like, okay, how do they go about this? Well, here's some tools that are ready made that I know I can use and I can put in the game and just kind of grab those and immediately put them in there. Um, likewise, there's kind of a uh, member membership services uh, section. Uh, so you could use the, um, you know, if it's a secret society, the PCs might have to infiltrate it. So they might have to track how their relationship with the uh, secret society is going. Uh, and we have rules for that in the game mastery guide. And then you can, they can start getting access to these membership services. So they can also kind of like use the group's resources against them. Uh, over the long term by kind of like calling in political favors and that kind of thing. Uh, we got some name suggestions. We got uh, the Horde Keepers. I think that's uh, uh, I think that's a pretty good um, direction to go in. Uh, TRD G11 is really going for the uh, clearly a, a Megan Thee Stallion fan uh, wants to get that name in there. Uh, Yeah, there's um there's a note that if they've got you know this long history and 400 years of minutes, um, they should be going after something that is not immediately noticeable to society, but the that the PCs uh, you know kind of work on the scale where uh, they're like, oh, this is a, a big danger, not something that's going to bother people in their daily lives, but down the road is going to culminate in something disastrous. I um, remember. And I, I wonder, go ahead, Patrick. Oh, it just made me think of what their goal would be. Uh, just I remember the book, The Scar, they're, um, by China Mabel, they're hunting this leviathan, and you don't know why. And then you find out they actually want it to tug them toward a breach in reality where they could change the whole world. So, like, I wonder what the purpose of the horde would be. Like, are they trying to buy something or bribe something? Or yeah. So I guess I, I just kept... Patrick has the most haunted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, you were you were almost to your your grand conclusion, I think. Oh, I just uh, I was just saying, I wonder what they're uh, you know I 
if they have a horde, it probably has a purpose. So I wonder what the purpose of that horde is. Hopefully it's not just to lay in a bed of gold, which is cool, but like, you know, maybe there's something bigger going on. Yeah, I think there's um like if we look at the the dragon's motivation, if we go with the the idea of it being kind of like a first world dragon or first world draft of a dragon that is kind of, you know, something a little weirder. Um, and we have like we have like the cryptid rules in Dark Archive. If it was something that we we use those to kind of adapt it and say, you know, it's 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 got these these weird cryptid abilities. And there are a few different ways that can go, but you know, kind of use that as a basis. It could be that its motivation deals with the first world in some way, right? If it's it's kind of got the like mad at my creators, I will see them fall kind of thing, right? What kind of you know maybe it's uh, so so. Here's a thought: like um, the these these thieves are stealing treasure and it looks like they are stealing treasure they're accumulating wealth but there's a history behind each of the pieces of treasure they're stealing or you know one piece from each thing they're stealing and they all trace back to the first world or to fey in some way and so the pcs can start start kind of discovering the history of these things and slowly be like well this it seems like this conspiracy has something to do with the first world um, and then you know maybe they uh you know that's that's a good way to kind of set up a climax that takes them to a new and different place if they, uh, you know, have to make it to the first world through this, uh, to stop this, you know, super weapon made of magical resonant trinkets or whatever, right? Um, something along those lines. This has some big thaumaturge energy going on here, gathering all these items yeah. of power and significance for some kind of ritual or, or end game. Yeah, yeah, so like if was... the thaumaturge is in your party, they're going, oh, yeah, I, I, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's got that like great like this makes sense if you look at it from this angle, but maybe less so if you come and look at it from the other angle, which is really fun. Um, I was kind of thinking about the like, well, it's like it's a discarded draft, right? So what kind of things is it doing? And like the fact that maybe it wants to like swap out its blueprints with the approved blueprints for all the other dragons in like the Akashic Library, right? <laughs> It's gonna swap yeah, these around. The <laughs> yeah, and we have um so the the cryptids adjustments that we have in Dark Archive are experimental, mutant, primeval, and rumored. Um and you know, I th I think you could kind of look at like what abilities do I want to give this and then go from there. I think on theme alone, primeval is probably the or experiment are kind of the most directly related to that that core idea of it. Um, and could be a good way to kind of like create your big boss by taking a dragon and applying this rather than, you know, making it from scratch. Uh, and then you can kind of, can kind of tweak from there. Uh, somebody else noted, um, Hey, it needs a, it probably needs a ritual to go to the first world and those cost money. So it might be like, it's, uh, it's in parallel, you know, behind the scenes, creating this ritual, um, to, to do some horrible Feywild or a uh, first world related thing. Uh, and you know it needs this ritual needs specific components that are um, that originated on the first world or something similar to that. Yeah, uh, somebody noted it, uh, Seth Tech noted if it's Fey, they might target things tied to the material world to slowly pull it into the first world, right? So you could you could have it. Um, uh, trying to not just return itself to the first world or get revenge, but to kind of drag everybody else kicking and screaming along with it. So, um, you know, it might take a whole region or a city or something. And so it presents a bigger danger to the material plane, um, especially if it's uh, if this is happening in an area that the PCs um, care about and they have stakes in. I was thinking about <laughs> sort of that... Uh... The, the tropey idea of like, you know, the scholar hires you to go explore the ruin. And as long as you retrieve item X for them, you can take keep all the rest of the treasure that you find. So the PCs might have an interaction with the cult that's like that early on where they're like, oh, yeah, well, they yeah. just want these notes or this item and we get all the gold, whatever. And then later on, it's like, oh, yeah, that seems like they may have been tied <laughs> into this plot, too. Yeah. This yeah, is, I think this that's is uh, there, there's that. An Sorry, go ahead, Logan. Uh, I was just going to say that, uh, yeah, I, that could be the kind of thing where it's like they have a bunch of uh, uh, of members, but they aren't quite as strong as the PCs. So they've got the numbers, but 
you know, they have some dungeon that they know they're going to get eaten if they go into. So they're like, well, we'll we'll hire out for this one. And that kind of gets the PCs embroiled in this whole thing. Uh, all right, back to you, Mike. I was I was just going to note that uh, pretty much everyone who has, you know, watched Disney movies since the 90s should probably be aware that whenever somebody tells you that they only want one thing from the treasure vaults and the rest is yours, it never ends well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And your position I, I is to... Vizier, you say. <laughs> <laughs> I watch only one thing and I'll also have your silence. <laughs> okay so uh I, I think that gives us kind of a, a an idea of the the kind of the general scheme there i think we've got something where uh, uh I, I i like the idea of you know kind of pulling part of the material plane into the first world and that whether that's the goal or just kind of a side effect uh, i think the the Quasi dragon doesn't necessarily need to care either way. Um, uh, that could be um, something that you know we we flesh out later. Uh, but what? Uh, so that's the plan. We need these fey uh, or these first world or fey originating uh, pieces of treasure to get it there. Uh, and then, kind of, what's the 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 tricky part is always kind of the middle. How how does all that flow together? Um, and how do we structure that? So you've got uh, kind of the surface level. We, we've got some ideas of how the PCs might get involved in this. Um, and I think a lot of these can work together. You know, they see the symbol, they start getting curious. They find the organization. The organization is like, oh, we are, we are just some humble collectors. We would like to hire you to uh, collect this. This is just our viral marketing campaign. Don't worry about it. Um, and then, you know, the PCs kind of start to get involved. They might need to infiltrate and kind of start learning more about the secret society. Um, but we kind of need a layer here, I think, that is, who are the other people in leadership in the society? Who are the other movers and shakers? Um, so I'd like to get some ideas from the panel and from chat, just some other NPCs who might be good fits for this. So one of the things uh, that immediately popped to my mind was... Uh, anybody who maybe has partially overlapping goals with the dragon, uh, so something in the realm of, you know, fey lords who maybe want the gate but don't want the dragon to take it all the way. So you have some of those kind of interesting intermediary encounters where uh, they might be also going for a piece of the treasure you're going for or attempting to bargain with you and subvert the dragon at kind of the midpoint of this little adventure. Uh, something along those lines could be interesting here. Um, there's a good suggestion from Total Twiggy in chat who says a museum owner. Um, I think that's that's kind of a fun one because if we have this long term scheme, you could have a like an elderly museum owner who is essentially like, yeah, I'll work with you as long as I can put these on display. And the dragon's like, you can put them on display for 57 years and then I'm going to need them back. <laughs> right. The same way, you know, you see a painting on loan from a, a collection. Right. It's the uh, you know, these are these are all on loan from the secret society, essentially. Uh, and then you can kind of have a character else. who's who's in between on alignment, you know. Yeah, it's a great way to have somebody else pay for all of your storage and security while you're off making ritual happen, you know. Yeah, I like the idea of there being like a reveal or a uh, a reveal or a betrayal of some kind, like someone who's helped the PCs, who maybe is like a mentor or a a person who they think maybe someone in power in the region that, you know, kind of comes in, helps them out, and they think they're on, that person is on their side, and then it's revealed they are also one of the kind of higher-ups in the cult. I think that's always a nice trope where it kind of shakes things up and makes the players question who can they trust, which I think is kind of a good thing for an adventure like this, where you, a little paranoia in an adventure like this isn't a bad thing. Yeah, um, especially, could, um, go ahead, Linda. Oh, I was just thinking that could tie in really well with what uh, Possible Cabbage was saying in chat for um, some members who are people the PCs don't want to or cannot fight. So like if they have a patron who's politically powerful and they can't just deal with them by, by busting in with the swords and magic, they're going to have to, they're going to have to find a social approach or something that's less direct. 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's really cool, especially if you I, I think you get them enough kind of friends or, you know, uh, uh, relatable people in the society that they can be friends with that they then have to question which ones are on their side and which ones aren't. Uh, I think you do the reveal early enough that they can kind of have some doubt uh, of the other folks involved. Um, and I and you have some of those be um, be like genuinely good people. Um, who are just kind of mixed up in this so that you can have, uh, you know, a more of an emotional connection to them. You can kind of say like, well, if you kind of pull back from all these people and stop sharing with them as much, then you're, you're, you know, hurting the feelings of someone that you've grown close to. Um, I think you can kind of, uh, with a, with a intrigue heavy thing like this, it's good to have some, uh, some of that story as well. So it's not all just, oh, I, we're pretty confident everybody's going to betray us. So we just need to, I guess we'll just go kill all of them, right? <laughs> Solution. Uh, and just as a nod, those... I was going to say, just as a nod towards, I saw someone asking about, like, you know, with Book of the Dead, there's all these undead PCs now, and we were talking about this museum and stuff. A fun hook that you could have for the players that goes into this is that one or more of the players was a museum exhibit before this giant first uh, world uh, ritual began to hit its crescendo uh, here, and that could be an entertaining way to allow the players themselves to also be the clues, maybe in ways that they don't know right at first going in. Just, just trying to get a, a poppet PC in there or a, a, <laughs> a automaton. Well, and dead could also have super long memories in the same way that dragons could. So they could be an interesting source of information for the cult's mm -hmm. past. Yeah. Of course, the clues were written on the inside of the mummy's wrappings the whole time. How come none of us <laughs> thought to unravel him? <laughs> oh there's an interesting suggestion here from wintergreen uk and the dragon has been supporting the growth of the city and construction because the buildings and roads etc are part of the ritual itself yeah and you can kind of do it's kind of like a, a carnegie thing right it's like oh look at these altruistic things this this wealthy person has done uh, which i think is immediately going to ping a light on any modern player's brain that they're probably uh, dangerous um, so you might have to, you know, do some finessing on that one uh, if you don't want it to be dreadfully obvious immediately. Um, I'd also I'd like to get some ideas from chat on. I think we need kind of like two things for this master. We need kind of like their their dragon identity or their uh, proto dragon identity. So I don't know, maybe their name has fewer syllables than a, a modern dragon. Uh, and I, we also need like an alias for them and an appearance um, that they can adopt. Um, I, I also, I do like, there's kind of a, a nice, um, synergy there between, you know, shape changing, uh, and deception and, and the first world and fey kind of tropes, uh, as well as some dragon stuff. So it kind of, uh, you know, it really kind of, it's the kind of thing that feels natural. If that happens, you're like, oh, of course it's able to do that. It's, you know, it, it's from the first world. They're all, you know, kind of midsummer nights dreamy over there. Uh, what are some, uh, oh, go ahead, Linda. I was thinking just generally for thinking about what the dragon's um, non-draconic identity is, how um, how visible and public are they? How much of a big figure are they? Or do they maybe even have multiple yeah. identities that they use where they have one who's like, oh, yeah, this one's the mayor, but this one's, uh, but this one's like, some underworld figure that that who knows and then part of the reveal is like wait a minute these are the same yeah i think you could um especially given that this is if it's kind of a dark archive vibe i think it'd be fun to have them be kind of that like willy wonka role where it's like oh yes this eccentric billionaire who nobody's seen in in a decade they're just hiding out in their estate and keeping to themselves right um i think that could be a, a fun direction to go with it um, I think you, we want a layer of mystery there. Uh, you could also do that kind of, uh, another classic trope, which is, um, oh yes, this is my, uh, a, a portrait of my grandfather. Gee, that looks exactly like you. How, how odd. <laughs> <laughs> that 
that family line where the genes are just unusually strong because you know there's there is right. a long record of birth certificates and portraits of each lord of the family but they all appear to describe the same individual <laughs> yeah uh, your hair Seth and put on some glasses <laughs> Uh, Seth Tech in chat mentions a two-headed dragon, uh, half body, ha chromatic, half metallic. Uh, they can jump between personality based on the heads. Um, th that's one that you could kind of do like, oh, it's these two NPCs were actually the bad guy all along, uh, which would be which would be pretty fun. Uh, so one also... of the things I want to go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say, with a two-headed monster, you also always have the option to play with like how you build it and deploy it in your boss fight, right? Because if this was like a proto-dragon, maybe it really was like a couple of ideas all mushed together, and at yeah. some point in the fight, you have your you know your armor break scene where you're now fighting two unfinished dragons uh, from the two-headed singular larger dragon you started with. Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> it's uh, like Ooh's somebody wedding, uh, but like take it up to take it up to 11. <laughs> uh, somebody mentioned the Jabberwock earlier in chat as kind of like a a dragony first worldy creature and I think that excuse me looking at the the Jabberwock in uh, Bestiary 2 might get some good ideas for uh the type of weirdness that would make sense for this dragon. Um it doesn't sound like this adventure would be at the level where you could fight the actual Jabberwock, um, but that could be some good inspiration. Uh, so what are some of the other kind of adventure things the party might do um, as a part of this, this kind of whole adventure? Uh, because I think you have kind of continuously running through it, you've got this, uh, this conspiracy and this mystery that you're uncovering uh, until you can um, get to the later stages of it. Uh, but what are some things you kind of do in the meantime? Some, you might be working for the secret society if you're infiltrating them. Uh, if it's, you know, location based, as we mentioned, you know, kind of tying this all into one uh, settlement or something like that. Uh, there might be some kind of standard things happening around there. Um, I think you could also, uh, on that latter point, you could set up kind of like a, a, a parallel threat that is in, in the long term, not as dangerous as what this dragon's getting up to but is kind of a continuous problem, right? Whether it's like, uh, you know, a, a, a dangerous um, gang of bandits or something, or uh, a more natural threat that is kind of continually going. So it's like, you can't, you know, just rest and fully dig into this because there's always something to deal with uh, around you. Uh, do folks have some thoughts on what some of those challenges might be? Some of those side missions, so to speak? The uh, the kind of natural arc of an adventure like this would almost be Secret Society hires you to get first piece of thing that is needed, and especially if we've got, you know, a, a secret monster who's got some shape-changing abilities and stuff going on. Uh, and so kind of following that thread would naturally sort of take you to, okay, so at some point you have collected enough things for them that the party is starting to draw the lines between wait a plus b plus c you know plus a def that we haven't found yet equals you know cataclysm orb or whatever uh and so <laughs> right around the time that the party is figuring out that they've been helping build a cataclysm orb would be a great time to bring in that other threat who is not the secret society but is maybe the bandit lord who wants to build the cataclysm orb as well to you know hold uh the local nation prisoner or uh what have you uh insert himself as the new king um so if you have that thread of these things all together equal end result, then you get a lot of kind of fun intersections of who else would want to be able to reach that end result and how would interacting with them give you more and more of those clues in uh, figuring out who's your friend, who's your foe, uh, who you're going to face along the way and how you all ultimately get there. Yeah. There could be um, a I point. think there's also... Go ahead, Patrick. Sorry. Well, I was going to say there could be a point when you're trying to get this multi-part uh, in-place MacGuffin where someone you defeat 
uh, they accuse the players of being part of this society, which could be one of the first clues that the players have that they are getting sort of manipulated. And that person who was defeated, it could sometimes the trope is that that, act, that person, that character, whoever they are, becomes an ally of the PCs once the PCs realize that they've been helping out the cults unknowingly. Yeah, that's a fun one. I think you can also kind of play it either way where, um, you know, if the PCs are trying to investigate or trying to infiltrate the cult, then it can be like, oh, well, now publicly we are getting called out as members of the cult and we have to not reveal everything about the cult, but also don't go to jail, right? Uh, and if they aren't in <laughs> infiltrating the cult, um, then it's a little more, you know, uh, straight straightforward there. Um I also think, you know, we kind of mentioned, uh, you know, kind of going on a, a quest and returning an item for this cult. It could also be like, oh, we're not, the cult says, okay, we're not going to go here because there's a bunch of, you know, rust monsters and stuff. We really need somebody, uh, somebody better equipped for this to handle it. And when the PCs get in there, they find a, another threat, which they don't know at the time is the side threat. But that can be a good way of kind of drawing attention away from this, you know, this other part of the plan, if they think they've, if they think they've found something different, they might not realize uh, what they initially found. Whereas if it's more straightforward, they might. So say they, they have to go into this, uh, this underground cavern and find this old, you know, lost, uh, you know, uh, Oswald Cobblepot kind of uh, character, right? Find these, uh, this gear that he was supposed to be collecting. Uh, but while they're down there, they encounter some Durgar and find out that there's a Durgar settlement underneath. And, you know, oh, they're going to come for us. Look out, everybody. This is this is the real threat, right? Um, and that kind of serves as a a, um, a side challenge. Whether it's related uh, to the, the secondary threat or not, um, one thing that the PCs might be able to do is once they figure out where the what the cult's trying to gather and where they're going to go next, setting up some kind of a, a trap or an ambush or something like that, um, so maybe maybe it's the cult members or their patsies who spring the trap, or maybe it's someone else who's interested in the item, and that helps them learn more about what's going on when they get a chance to talk to those folks. Yeah. Uh, Maggard and chat mentioned a local newspaper. Um, I think that is something that uh, that could be used in more campaigns. Is kind of like you keep hearing, uh, you keep seeing what the newspaper is saying about you, uh, and you know the people that you're hanging out with. And get to see kind of like the distorted version of um, of your exploits. Uh, I, th I think because Mike's on here, this makes me think of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, where uh, the the most recent one, where you get to the end and they give credit to somebody else for for saving the day. I think it's a uh, uh, that can be a fun idea to play with, kind of a, a J. Jonah yeah. Jameson's Daily Bugle kind of paper. <laughs> Possible Cabbage had an idea of above to a hook where the PCs are investigating a break in and they have to figure out what was taken and why that could be something that was earlier in the story for sure. Yeah, I uh, I like a red herring, but I also like that uh, that old rule that you know anything that appears in the story should be relevant to the story before the story ends, uh, and and so definitely that's kind of a fun thing to play with is something that seemed less important early on in the adventure that ends up being the uh, the thing that flips a big switch later on, uh, or that the PCs maybe walked right past and were like, yeah, well, we obviously don't need this 800 pound gargoyle statue in this ancient tomb. So we're not lugging that back into civilization with us only to discover like way later that the 800 pound gargoyle statue was just a gargoyle who like, if they had woken it up would have had some really important piece of information uh, relevant to the whole plot. <laughs> On that note, um, I could see like if you have the um, that that idea of the layout of the city being important, maybe there's somebody who's going around and you're like, wow, there's somebody who's doing arson and destruction around the city. What's the deal with them? Why are they doing that? And then eventually you figure out it's like, oh, this isn't actually one completely unconnected threat. This is somebody who knows what the dragon is up to, but doesn't necessarily think they can trust the PCs because they think they're working with the cult. But you can eventually like get them on your side and decide yeah. like, well, is there is there something that's related to this that we would want to do? Like we don't necessarily agree with their methods. People are getting hurt, but maybe maybe there's some other way we can disrupt this this ritual. That's a really 
That's a really fun idea, Linda. And I think um, if if this plot is against the first world, you could have that be like a Fey NPC, um, and then you know that's a really fun NPC to role play because there are a lot of different directions you can take that. Um, and it's also a character who can very easily be a little bit tricky to uh, to get in good with, right? Because they're they're mm-hmm. used to Fey politics and not uh, not people saying what they mean ever, honestly. <laughs> um, so that could be a kind of fun. Uh, figure to introduce. I definitely right. think if so, there's a... Go ahead, Patrick. Oh, I was going to say, if there is sort of a, a ritual to um, that's involving the city in various locations, I definitely think a good sort of near the end set piece is like where the PCs sort of have to race to various locations in the city that I don't know are like anchor ritual focus points that will destabilize reality and pull the city into the, or wherever into the first world. So there, I don't know. I always think of those as fun kind of set pieces because it's something familiar, but all of a sudden it's a little twisted because reality is starting to wear thin and having the players have to run to places they've been to a lot, but all of a sudden it's kind of different. As, as to prevent like various steps of the you know multi-part ritual is a good good end game trope yeah i like that um in chat uh let's see whose was this uh maggard said uh characters must realize maps of the city are off as the correct maps show the rune for the ritual um so that that could be a fun one i i do like similar to the newspaper i like something you know tangible that um the pcs can encounter so like looking at the maps and just kind of going that We've been all over this because we've been trying to, you know, fight dangers of the city. We've had to get to learn it, and this does not look right. You know, um, that could be a, a, a fun visual. Uh, TRDG11 says suggests for the NPC perhaps a good fey queen who wants to be a god of good or neutral, uh, go between the realms of fey and the material plane nations. Um, so that could be, a, uh, an idea, um, kind of depends on how, like how, how comparable to our threat we want that character to be, whether it's, you know, this is somebody on their level, or if it's more of like a low level Fey agent who is, uh, kind of, um, uh, closer to the PCs in, um, in renown and power level. Yeah, I think the spicy thing there is if your your off threat is dangerous in a very different way. So a quasi dragon is probably physically still pretty powerful and imposing, something that the Fey Queen probably wouldn't want to like go wrestle for the, you know, ritual pieces. Uh, cause then that incentivizes Fey Queen to work through the PCs and make sure to kind of keep them nice squared center as the uh the main engine of the story. Uh, so that's probably probably something that's more in like the mid to low level, maybe about the same level as the PCs, but without their kind of you know more combat focused uh, nature and abilities. Yeah, or perhaps and I, that's has something the limitations. We, yeah, right, and she could be working from the first world. You know, if she's not on the material plane, she could be kind of projecting herself or sending avatars uh, to to do her bidding or something like that. So she can't really access the full power. Um, the what Mike was saying about the level is is one of the things we have to deal with a lot because mysteries um, can be pretty tricky to do at the very high levels um, because a lot of magic starts. Uh, it becomes easier for you to kind of break those types of adventures or, uh, or short circuit them. Um, so they often work best at like the low to mid uh, levels of play. Uh, there's also an interesting thing for the end game. Um, I want to get get folks' ideas on kind of like the best ways to go about it. Um, there, are, there's kind of like the classic thing is the the dragon's going to do this big ritual, and then we have to go to where they're doing the ritual and stop them. Um, but I think with what we've been talking about with kind of the city and you know you know arsonists and and weird maps and uh, the the maybe ley lines or or whatever make being important. I think that also means that the PCs could bait out the the big boss and get it to come to them if they're like, oh, there's not supposed to be a building here? What if we start a bar here and we build one? Uh, just kind of like start kind of needling them in a way that kind of draws them out. Um, having multiple paths like that is a good way to kind of like make 
make the PCs feel like they uh, they made this happen. And if they don't want to do that, then they can kind of, you know, wait for it to come to them. It will kind of depend on how your group likes to play. Yeah, definitely uh, one of the things that's going to come into play, too, is if this is just one link in a longer campaign, uh, you know, if this is maybe you're adventuring around 8th level and the group plans on doing things for a long time, and one of the things you want to do is move on from the city where this particular adventure is taking place once this thing is done, you could have it be like, well, you know what the easiest way to disrupt this ritual would be is if we went down into the sewers with, you know, these charges and we just dropped this city block right here right this is the <laughs> most heroic way to save the most lives and do a lot of things but it's also going to cause a lot of property damage and even the people who we're trying to save might not be super happy with us once it's done <laughs> this is like if, if the party were made of the iconics that's the party that has fumbus in it uh, <laughs> it's like a little demolition will fix this right up they, i really like the that streets idea here that, are like... full of potholes and you do it anyway you can choose, like, you know, the path that the most reliable path may have the greatest collateral damage and consequences for later. Mm -hmm. Or, like, if you wait to, and whereas, like, if you wait to let the, the dragon build up more things, you're going to have to deal with more first world shenanigans and, like, weird environmental effects and hazards and things like that. But that road may allow you to um, have there be fewer consequences for people at the cost of, like, having more dangerous encounters. So, you know, are you, which, which yeah. risk are you going to take? Like, how hard do you want this to be? And those sorts of hazards yeah, and, and weird field effects could appear in different places depending upon what what route the PCs choose. Whether they're you know something that the dragon carries with them that you that you fight just before a little bit of, or whether there's something that's more widespread. If the and uh, if the dragon is doing things across the entire city, uh, you can also do that trade off between um, for time. Like you know, mm -hmm. if one option is to build new establishments to disrupt this rune. That's that's time consuming and you have to, you know, get permits and spend money and that kind of thing. And blowing up the street is faster and more direct and might get the same results, but also might, you know, kill some people um, or, <laughs> you know, destroy somebody's place of business or whatever. Right. Um, so those are the kind of trade offs that um, that are are fun to put in front of the PCs, especially when you're dealing with kind of an intrigue scenario where it's like, uh, you know, you need to you need to feel consequences other than hit points um, to really make it sing. I love the, uh, uh, instead Cooper, of blowing Cooper up a block, just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. Okay, uh, I was, Cooper Jair said, instead of blowing up a block, maybe the PCs find a ritual that allows them to plane shift the block to disrupt the dragon ritual. And I was like, ha ha, you'll never be able to move this block into the first world if we've already moved it into the <laughs> shadow plane. Check in mate, dragon. <laughs> And then maybe when that block yeah, comes think. back, it's different than it was when it when it before it first made the trip. And then that can make that place an interesting place to adventure in the future, trying to figure out well what happened with this yeah. place, and who might yeah, have moved in like, yeah. was over there. We'll fix it later. Just, Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'd go hang out in Shadow Alley. I mean, that sounds cool. <laughs> Uh, that, that's also a fun one. You know, you, you, if you have a big change like that, or if you know you get toward the end and the the first world starts to you know gets mixed up with the the spot on the material plane those also b provide good like post adventure codas you know you kind of like okay well you've stopped the threat and now are you going to clean up what the mess you made after this or are you going to get out of here right and like how do how do people react to that um something that you can kind of use as a uh, a nice uh dessert to this uh this campaign <laughs> Uh, possible cabbage asks to an outside observer: Are the PCs the bad guys? They did send my house to the shadow plane. <laughs> I, I think to an outside observer, the PCs are always the bad guys. Oh, <laughs> Mike, Mike has introduced Cat to the chat. Uh, Mike, Mike, we have Aww. you know the rules. Oh, I do. Hold on a second. Oh gosh, when a cat has introduced themselves, they must be introduced. This is Little Bird. Uh, Little Bird very much wanted to be a part of the panel, and now Little Bird is going to go play over there. <laughs> right. And uh, we're actually getting close to time here, so I think we're going to let Little Bird play us out. Um, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us and contributing some fun ideas to this, uh, this, this case file. 
Um, and I hope you got some stuff that you can use in your home games, whether it was specific things or, or some, some advice on how to structure these kinds of things. Uh, if anybody has any last words before we call this panel to a close, um, go ahead and drop those now. Uh, if not, I'll just have everybody kind of uh, uh, remind folks who they are and where to find them, uh, starting with Mike. Yeah, so I am Michael Sayre, senior designer here at Paizo. You can find me on Twitter at MichaelJSayre1. Uh, and I'm a pretty regular participant on the Pathfinder 2E subreddit and the Paizo forums as well. So uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to interact with some more of you and uh, see those of you who I talk to on a semi-regular basis again sometime soon. All right, and Linda. I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. Uh, you can find me on Twitch twice a week on the stream Arcade Mark, twitch.tv slash Arcade Mark, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific and Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific, along with uh, former Paizo designer Mark Seifter. And I can also be found on the uh, Arcade Mark Discord at tiny.cc slash Arcade Mark. All right, and Patrick. Hi, I'm uh, Patrick Hurley. I'm the se a senior editor at uh, Paizo, and uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you can also check out my website if you ever want to read some of my stories, patrickhurleywrites.com. And I even have a few uh, Paizo things that, uh, that I've written some awesome short fiction for. So, or some, some, I think it's great short fiction for some awesome characters. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you all. Uh, I'm Logan Bonner. You can find me on Twitter at Logan Bonner. That's going to be the easiest way to get a hold of me. Uh, thank you for joining us here today and goodbye. <laughs>